gentlemen welcome to the what are we on now the third or fourth community choice i really can't remember how many we've done now um yeah welcome everyone see laws in the chat animated af mike rocks who says the dreamcast jungle is in a slightly different time zone we are international my friend pc you made it on the one stream, I don't have my webcam on as well. Just know that I am... I am Dreamcast, up to six billion players. I am wearing my t-shirt as we go. Thank you for the follow, free ride. Dreamcast Junkyard is on GMT minus 10 minutes. Um, let me know if, again, as usual, if the sound levels are okay, because as usual, I never know. I can never know what is uh, what sounds good if I sound too loud or too quiet, and we can mess about with it. Uh, no, the uh, Kitreso Boys Gang Gang did not get uh, did not get selected. Thankfully, I thought I'd put it in there for you, and I did think there would be more of a campaign to get me to shout random Japanese words into a microphone. To be honest, but um, alas, it was not uh, it was not to be. What's the echo you're getting? Echo from from game sound, or from my voice? Because my monitor is quite loud on here. Let me turn my monitor down. See if that. Uh... 
Yeah, you need to get some more uh, more followers to get us to that six billion mark. And then, uh, and then there's no lying. So yeah, I got some new alerts on the stream today. Just been messing around, trying to get some stuff converted. But anyway, we are playing. Um, well, it depends what. Talking of time zones, it depends what region you're in. Either Tokyo Highway Challenge Two, if you're European. Uh, if you're not European and you are from America, then you're probably more familiar with this game as Tokyo Extreme Racer 2. And if you're not American and you're from Japan, you're probably more familiar with it called Shituku Battle 2. Is this the only game that has three different titles for three different regions on Dreamcast? Be interested to, to know that. Um, it is... It's pretty straightforward. It's a racing game, well, it's a racing battle type game that um, that kind of has you racing one-on-one -on -one against people and you've got a bit of an energy bar, as you will see in a second. So it's not a traditional racing game, um, but it's really good fun. And it's one of those one of those games that because of the setting and because of the fact it's at night time, it really has sort of um, survived the test of time and does look still look really good today. So uh, we're going to do some quests today, which is the main kind of story mode. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll see how far we get in. We'll start a new game. We ain't going to be able to afford an A-class car. So uh, the original the original version, the original game, I played quite a bit back in the day. I never played the sequel until until recently. Um, and I have to say, when I booted this up, I was amazed at how detailed the car models are. I think they look unbelievable. To be fair, for this sort of technology, the, the, the you know because they were able to save a lot of the processing power because the the um, given the fact it's at night and obviously there's not much detail that goes on around it, they put it all into the car models and they look absolutely amazing. They really, really do. I'm, I'm super, super impressed with them. And if you're into your Japanese hot hatches then uh, you'll certainly find some familiar, familiar cars. We're going to choose this, which is one of my favourite old-school Japanese cars, a Honda CRX, which is a, an absolutely gorgeous piece of JDM machinery. And we can afford this, so we're going to buy it. Um, we are not going to change the name of this. Uh, we will have a number plate. Uh, let's go... Obviously a nice DCJY number plate. We'll buy that. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, this is a long-running series. Since uh, since this, or since these ones, there have been many, many more versions of, of this uh, game on PS2, PS3, uh, and then on the Xbox 360 was the most recent, I think, entry in the series called Import Tuna Challenge. They all follow pretty much the same format with the same uh, gang rivals and things in there. Um, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll have a look at how we get on now. I don't know if there's any actual storyline in this. Uh, in the newer ones, there's like a load of storyline that you have. So one of the big criticisms of the game is that it's not an awful lot to it. So you've basically got one stretch of motorway, which you can see you kind of unlock some at the bottom there as well. But that's kind of your lot. Um, so if you if you're after track variety, you certainly won't find that in these games. Um, but they do try and dress it up by allowing you to do different loops and go to different, uh, you know, different, um, different directions and things like that. Pick the Deu Honda Matisse. No, I can't. I can't not pick the uh, the CRX. I'm afraid it's a it's a personal favourite of mine. So yeah, as I was saying, the car models are just absolutely stunning. They really, really are, and it's because of the um, the visuals of the. Like I said, the nighttime aesthetic as well. It just looks so good. So the general gist of the game is you cruise around. You see loads of these kind of um, NPC cars, so like taxis and stuff. And every now and again, you're going to start to see some other boy racers like us. And the idea is we go behind them. I haven't seen a single one yet. There's two behind me. Maybe we should slow down and let the two behind me overtake instead of trying to catch those two guys in front. So you go behind them, you give them a quick flash, 
and they know what's up and then it's time for a, uh, a street race and essentially as long as you if you beat the guy then you move on and you move on to the next one and generally speaking or how it used to work is if you beat so many guys from one of the gangs then you unlock the the kind of the the the, the bosses of each gang and the general idea of the game is you um, you kind of go through and you beat all the gangs beat all the bosses and there are I don't know if it's the same on this one, but in the latter ones you were able to um, to like unlock the um, the gang cars if you uh, if you beat the boss. Right, so we're going to get behind this guy, give him a flash, and then we shall hopefully get our first win under our belt. And obviously, all as you do this, you are earning credits to upgrade your car, buy new cars, and generally take over the. Uh, why can I not start this race? Oh, because I'm not pressing. I'm not pressing the right button. That's why. Right. So give him a flash. Here we go. Yeah, flash the gang members. They should put it on the back of the box. So you can see there, rolling boy. There's a number of different gangs. Um, all got different icons, just so you can sort of separate them apart. And as you overtake one. The idea is, is your energy bar, will, oh sorry, the, your enemy's energy bar will deplete, whereas yours obviously does not, unless you hit the wall, in which case uh, then it does. So, so we just need to uh, to keep ahead. A pretty, pretty basic sort of format, but um, I always quite enjoyed it because you can, it's a bit mindless. You can just kind of put it on and play it. And, some of the races do get really challenging or at least on the versions of this game I've played and on the original version on the Dreamcast some of the latter races you know, you really have to upgrade your car to have any chance uh, of, of winning yeah it really does look outstanding to be fair I only played the first one of the series at that time really loved it, would hate love to get my hands on this one yeah it's it's actually one, I don't know if it's the same in of the um, American and Japanese versions but for the for the British, uh, sorry the European version, the PAL version it's one of the more expensive games, I don't think it's like ridiculously expensive but it's definitely one of the the more expensive PAL games to have in your collection um, as I said nothing mental but probably around the £50 mark nowadays probably just owing to the fact it was quite a late release. I think this was 2001. <laughs> PC says the, the, the UK, US version looks more extreme. What were, what were you playing the other day? Uh, what were you playing the other day, PC, that had extreme in it? I can't remember now. Was it, was it fit one of those fishing games? Right, there's so many taxis on this route and not many uh, gang cars. I do like the cars being towed as well. Like, that's an interesting touch. But yeah, graphically, as I said, it, there's not a lot to it from a, a um, uh, from a scenery perspective, and I think, as I said, that's one of the reasons why it still looks really good today. Like it does look impressive even by today's standards. And as I said, they really took the um, the character models, they really stepped up the car model. Sorry, compared to the first one, they're night like, and day different. Reception-wise, I think the first game... I mean, the games typically didn't used to review amazingly well outside of kind of um, Japan because I don't think it was a format that a lot of people really fully understood. You know, like everything else. And I've said this about other Dreamcast racing games that I've defended, but like a lot of people, like a lot of other Dreamcast racing games, people just want to just turn them on and have that arcade experience where they race against easy opponents and get to the finish some way so anything that kind of deviates from that standard format tend, tended to get uh, a lukewarm reception at best and I think um, the original game was one of the earlier releases on Dreamcast certainly in Europe I think it was um, it was out in the launch window if I'm not mistaken so it was within a certain amount of time after launch but it, it didn't review very well at all um, it was uh, it was a sort of a five out of ten game in many places, and I think it was mostly cited for the the lack of depth, lack of options with regards to the amount of um, uh, sort of tracks you can drive on. I don't think you can criticise the depth. I mean, there are 
uh, without going into the original game, I I don't know exactly how many gangs or how many um, cars there are to beat, but in the later games in the series, there was a huge amount of depth. A huge, amount, I mean, it's a similar sort of gameplay over and over again, but there was a ton of uh, uh, different gangs to take down. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Thank you for the follow, whoever that was. I haven't got my monitor in front of me, so I cannot see, but thank you. We will get to the six billion at some point, I'm sure. So this car doesn't handle particularly well. Not that I'm trying to find excuses for my subpar driver here. What is reverse, or is there no reverse? Maybe there is no reverse. Extremely expensive, yep. Certainly is, unfortunately. So this one, uh, I believe, reviewed a lot better than the original. I think um, I think it it, uh, it scored more like sevens, sometimes eights. I think the the sequel, obviously, a lot more polish. I don't know how much more depth is in this because, as I said, I've, well, this is I've never really played it properly. We'll do a couple more races here, and then we'll I think we'll go back and see how we're doing upgrade-wise. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's any storyline on this. Um, as I said, on, on the later games in the series, the uh, you'd have like dialogue from the different gangs as you progressed, sort of building up the story. I mean, it wasn't. We're not talking any, anything uh, Shenmue style, but. Um, it added a bit, a bit more personality to the uh, the experience. It wasn't just racing around Japanese motorways looking for people to flash. The official UK mag had some shocking st scores for some great games. Yeah, I agree. I think you know, games media in general has been one of those things over the years where they I don't know. It, it's very rare you get games journalists going against the grain, you know. And, and if one magazine gives it an eight, I swear that tends to mean that okay, we can't give it any much more or much less than what this magazine have given it. That's what it feels like a lot of the time in in, mod, in the modern world. And going back to then. Ironically, I think you know, back in the '90s, it was the criticism of most official magazines was that they were they were far too generous with their scoring I must admit I remember I was looking flicking through one of the Dreamcast magazines the other day and just seeing things like you know um, UEFA Strike again 8 out of 10 and I think Virtua Striker got 7 out of 10 it's like how did these games score so well but then I was saying this in PC stream the other day you know, you had games like Crazy Taxi, which, don't get me wrong, is a really great game and very deserving of the praise that it got. But, like, there's no depth to that game at all. I mean, yes, they included mini games and, and things like that, but there is no, there's no depth to warrant a 9 out of 10 for that game, which is what it scored across the board, mostly. Whereas something like Super Runabout, which is perfectly serviceable, handles really well, loads of variety in the missions, was scoring like sixes. I'm not saying it's a better it's a better game, it's a better experience, but there is a there's definitely a big divide around um, uh, first party products versus uh, lesser known titles. I think lesser known titles really struggle to get any traction within the um, within the media. So I remember playing the 360 version of this game or the, the, one of the sequels and I, I did it is quite a relaxing game just to sort of relax to and just drive around there's no real you know restart if you if you fail a race you just carry on with your driving and you'll catch up with them again and, and have a rematch but we're beating all these guys pretty easily so I think we'll do it let's keep going for now and then we'll see if there is any dialogue or what we can do in the menu when we start to unlock these Got our uh, our mileage down the bottom as well. So keep, it, keep an eye on how far we're doing. See what sort of gas mileage we're getting. 
can't agree with Crazy Taxi having no depth each to their own. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably being harsh saying no depth, but I mean, you know, it, there's not an awful lot to do, is there? Once you've uh, once you've beaten that game, I suppose it's it, it's a, it was a different world back then with a lot of games. The replayability came from high scores and. Um, Yeah, perfecting your runs and stuff, but maybe it's because I was never amazing at Crazy Taxi. Right, so this guy, I oh know we've got him. Oh. Now I don't know what the deal is. If you take one route and he goes another, what happens then? Or will he just follow me? Be surprised if advertising spend some kind of influence over editorial lines. Yeah, probably. I mean, well, you say that. Although, so funny story on this, Loz. Was it Loz that said that? Yeah. I remember reading about um, reading the re review from Red Dog in the official Dreamcast magazine UK, and I think they scored it a four. I'm pretty sure they scored it a four. It's a shame Mike's not in here because he'll t he normally tells me this. He'll correct me almost immediately. But I'm pretty sure they gave Red Dog a four. It was either a four or a five. And something happened, and I don't know what it was. They they ran a feature or something a month later or or a month or two later that something happened where they they covered the game again, and they issued a revised score based on it. And I thought that was really interesting at the time, and I was only like. 16 at the time but there was definitely something going on with that I mean I think that's a ridiculously low score for that game anyway to be fair but um, I'm pretty sure there was some weirdness going on with with that sort of thing I don't know that I don't know if what it was like back then and what it's like for the mainstream but I think one of the biggest problems with games journalism in general and review scores is you know the the PR companies, they they do whatever they can do to keep the journalists happy, you know, and journalists know that if they piss off the PR people, they might end up getting blacklisted and may not get free games anymore. I've been involved in the games journalism industry, not as a direct, um, not directly employed, but I've been working with PR people in games journalism from, uh, for about 15, 15 or so years now and there is a yeah there is a lot that goes on to uh, to make sure certain things happen not going to say anything anything that you might deem uh, unethical but uh, I think there is a lot of pressure on uh, on journalists to review things in a certain way let's put it that way Especially with the way embargoes are, are dealt with nowadays, where you can't show certain things. But anyway, I'm sure there was bias back then. Especially for an official magazine who obviously um, had to uh, had to get a lot of authorization from from Sega for a lot of the stuff that they uh, they, they they published. How much of a fine tooth comb they went through it, I don't know, but uh, yeah. Kiretsu Gang Gang, Boys Gang Gang is the only game in existence worth 10 out of 10. I'm trying to think what games Official Dreamcast Magazine in the UK gave a, gave a 10 out of 10 for. I know Shenmue was one of them, predictably. I mean, they had to, didn't they? I'm not sure they did. They, 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 oh, did they give Soul Calibur a 10 or was that a 9? I can't remember. But Shenmue was a definite 10. Or they gave it Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Thank you for the follow. Must admit that um, every time I can hear that, it uh, makes me jump a little bit now. Hey, Maddie. Good to see you, mate. I know you'd love to tune in for a bit of retro. Back in the day, the guys I trusted were the crew behind CVG. Yeah, CVG was amazing. I really miss CVG magazine. Although it was always difficult to sort of, you know, factor anything from their reviews with it only being out of five. Oh, look, we missed that race because he must have gone in the wrong direction. 
That was really interesting. Right, let's go back to the... Uh, return to the garage and see what we can do with this... Uh, with these coins now. So four wins. I don't know what the Class C car plus two is all about. DC GameSpot only gave one DC game a 10 and that was Soul Calibur. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Soul Calibur got a 10 in Dreamcast Magazine over here as well. I know Shenmue got one, but then they gave Sonic Adventure a 9. So, you know, that just shows how crazy they were. I always seem to upset people when I try and say that Sonic Adventure was not as good as everyone thinks it was. Right, so there doesn't seem to be any sort of story at the moment, which is a bit disappointing. But we can see... Okay, so we've got two more rolling guys to get in that gang. Knife and Forks. That's the worst gang name ever. Can you imagine saying that you were affiliated with Knife and Forks? Black Knights, Fine Drive, Curving Edge, Galaxy Racers, Max Racing, Elegant Wild, Departures, Twister, Diamond Image, Rhythm Box, Wind Stars, Super Speed Wagon, R Gangs, Cupid Arrows. So there's a lot of gangs. So you can see at the bottom, it tells you when they're likely to, when they'll appear. So most of it is you've got to defeat all of certain gangs beforehand. So there are a ton of gangs to take down in this. Wow. Loads and loads and loads. NFL 2K and Tony Hawk 2 got 9.9. .9. Couldn't quite get that extra 0.1. Yeah. They needed online mode, see, PC. If they had online, they'd have got the, the full 10. Don't mess. Knife and forks will fork you up. Absolutely. Right. Do we want to upgrade this car? Let's have a look. We probably don't need to yet, do we? Let's go back in and let's finish off these last two gang members. I, uh, does it say on... Appears on inner loop line. No, yeah, Roland guy. After you... Oh, is that the boss is telling me about, do you think? The... Oh yeah, because it's the one I haven't got locked. So, show, so that's because I was looking at one I hadn't unlocked. So we've got these boys. Races on inner loop line. Right, so we need, that's what we were doing though, wasn't it? Um, start. Yeah, C1 inner. Okay. Let's finish these ones off then. In my country, Spain, the bigger mag rate always rated so poorly Dreamcast games. Right by Sony. Yeah. There was some... Um... Well, I'm not sure I'm not sure how much that was the case over here, but CBG is Loz. I think it was you Loz. Um as Loz. Was it you or was it animated? Said it. Yeah, animated. Uh, CBG was definitely one of the um one of the best sort of impartial reviews. Although CBG did give Toy Racer one out of five, which I've never forgiven them for. So there is that blot on their history. Because we all know that Toy Racer. I don't know how you. I, I really don't understand how you could review Toy Racer as a one out of five game when it costs five quid and had was basically created for online play back in 90 in like 2000 how could you possibly score that so low right this guy might be quick because he looks like oh maybe not he's a different gang look although for some reason that that race didn't didn't actually start i wonder if it's because it didn't like it the fact there were all these uh, other trucks around Try again. Unless he doesn't want to race me. He's too scared. Word is getting around. Here we go. He's going to just drive off in the distance now, isn't he? Yeah. Well, maybe not. 
Uh, handling wise, it's. it's I mean, it, I, I'm. I am using like an entry level car, but it's very understeery. Not very responsive, but that could be the car more than anything else. So we'll reserve judgment on that until we get up to the nicer cars. But this. Um, in, in Japan, there was an anime called Mangan Midnight. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with it, um, which was very much aligned to this series. And I, indeed, some of the the late or some of the versions of this. All oh, right, okay. So we've beaten all the bot. There's looks like a boss guy is coming out now. Oh, no, it's a replay. Sorry. Yeah, Wangan Midnight was. Um, they did some uh, uh, some of these games based on that franchise as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Mr. Dreamcast. We, um, not myself, but some of the guys interviewed the uh, the editor for Mr. Dreamcast recently. Check it out on the uh, on the Dreamcast Junkyard. It's one of the one of the last three podcasts that we did. I'm pretty sure it was covered in there. And Tom, who runs the Junkyard, did a great article on the um, on the website about uh, magazines in general. Actually, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Out of Print Archive, which is a um, a guy who has been, I don't know if he's him or if he's got a team there, but he has been uh, scanning all of the old uh, magazines. They're amazing quality. All, all the, a lot of CVG magazines are on there, actually. I'm trying to read chat and not crash at the same time, which is not helping. To be fair to the NFL games on Dreamcast, though, they were, like, head and shoulders above anything else at the time. I can totally understand why they scored so highly. They were super, super impressive. If only we had a, a soccer game that was uh, of equal quality. I always found it quite ironic that Sega Europe spent about two-thirds of their marketing budget sponsoring three teams across Europe and actually never had a like a really good soccer game on Dreamcast which would have made probably a huge huge difference certainly in the UK certainly in Europe with the Euros happening in 2000 as well the lack of Pro Evo or FIFA was just I think it was just something that we, it never recovered from over here. I, I think people underestimate the selling power that, that those sorts of games have. Well, they did at the time, Century Dish. There was, um, when Pro Evo first came out, they were on um, N64. Well, obviously it started off on Super Nintendo and then it was on PlayStation 1, which is when Pro Evo, that sort of franchise, the, the uh, ISS Pro rather than ISS Deluxe started and then of course they were ISS 98 and ISS Pro were both on um, N64 as well and then when we got into the PS2 GameCube era I'm pretty sure uh, that ISS was on GameCube, it certainly was in, in Japan as Winning Eleven because I remember it, uh, wanting to import it, I don't know if it ever got released over here and then obviously when we got into the Xbox days, it was um, it was very much an Xbox title, Pro Evolution Soccer. So um, so it was uh, yeah it was they released it on all platforms. Yeah, I know it was different, but it was I mean ISS Pro 98 for example was called ISS Pro 98 on N64 and on. Um, PlayStation. I know it was a completely different engine, but um, I mean that wasn't uncommon at the time, was it? I mean, in the late 90s, it was very common for games to be have completely different development teams on the different platforms. It, you know, the the hardware it wasn't like we have now, where it, the hardware is, for, for all intents and purposes, for modern consoles, is basically the same, and games just get created once and sort of ported over. I mean, it was very different back then. But I'm pretty sure in the game, from, from sort of the next generation onwards, so PS2 and GameCube, I'm pretty sure they saw the same um, the same versions of Pro Evo, or whatever it was called by then. 
but yeah, it definitely, definitely hurt Dreamcast not having a uh, a good soccer game. And even when they did the the whole uh, arcadey type game with with Virtua Striker, it was um, you know, it was uh, it didn't even it didn't even do that right. It was pretty pants. Yeah, I kind of miss the B tier football games as well. But I mean, again, you look at the PS One, and the PS One had more B team, B level sort of football games, good ones that were quite playable compared to the Dreamcast. You know, uh, had had what it, what it, it were flagship titles on Dreamcast. I mean, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but things like uh, Adidas Power Soccer were, were really good fun to play on um, on PlayStation. Yeah, the little gang logos are cool. Um, the one thing, and they, they seem to be consistent throughout the entire series as well. Um, as I said, I'm not a huge, like I don't, I haven't invested an awful lot into this particular series as a whole, but the um, there does seem to be consistency throughout the entire series or the games I've played in the series anyway. The gang logos do seem to remain consistent. So, um, so yeah, has this guy got a pink car? Wow. Okay, so this is, I, I guess this is like a boss of some description, seeing as it's flashing the butterfly on the screen. PC, we're all inclusive here, mate. We are all inclusive. We just love to talk about games. This guy is going to wreck me with his pink car. I'm about to be destroyed by Catch Me Kate. Wow. That was probably a mistake. So the the uh, the competition level has definitely uh, increased somewhat. I think it's probably time to think about car upgrades, folks, or maybe a new car. That is that did not go well. That's my fault for taking the mech out of their uh, out of their pink car. Wanderer. Okay. It's a shame you can't see what cars are like out on the road. Right, I'm going to ignore that pink one, and there's 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 a couple more ahead, so we'll see if we can take them down before we go back to the garage and uh, and upgrade our car. No, I don't want to. I want to reject that opponent. She's trying to, she's trying to like race me now. She can smell blood. Yeah, there's definitely a big spike. I think it was. Um, it's just it's the nature of the game. I think you're just supposed to know when you need to uh, think about upgrading. I was thinking. I wonder if we deviated from the inner loop, which is why we've not now got the rest of those wanderers or whoever they were. Lost boys. No, what are they called? I think it's more of a tease. What you need to work towards. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's very little in the way of signposting in this game to tell you exactly what to do and where to go. So I think it is very much kind of a. Yeah, you really don't want to be racing this pink person yet. See who these guys are ahead of us. Right, we should be able to beat this guy. You can normally tell by the, the look of the car as well. I never actually owned the original, thinking about it. I know I rented it an awful lot. There was a rental shop up the road from my parents' house. And um, he had Dreamcast games, and this he didn't have many. I, I distinctly remember he had Jimmy White's 
pool or snooker, whatever it's called, and he had this. I remember those two because I rented both of them, an awful lot of it. Or not this, the original. So this one as well has some sort of network capability. It doesn't have multiplayer online, or didn't have, but um, I believe it has some sort of high score mode via the website or anything like that. So maybe we'll get that back online one day. Now I don't I don't think you get any penalty from anything really on this boss, to be honest. I think it's um I think it's pretty happy go lucky as far as just uh, yeah, take your race. If you win you win, if you lose you lose. I will say it's an absolute pleasure to play this after playing Taxi 2 for the last couple of weeks. For those who missed my comments in Discord, I um, I finally managed to uh, to beat Taxi 2 uh, this week because I didn't want to leave it unfinished. I had about three or four missions to do after the stream we did, and um, I was adamant to finish it. And the last mission is horrendous because there's a car. That's trying to like you've got to basically get to the end of the end of the route as quickly as possible as per every other mission but there's a car behind you who's trying to like basically kill you and you meet multiple cars on the way that are also basically trying to kill you and it's just the most frustrating experience in the world so uh but either way i was glad i finished it Jimmy White's pool is actually... Oh, Jimmy White's will win snooker, I think, to give it its full title. Or Jimmy White's 2 will win snooker. is actually really good. Like, the amount of variety in that game, which we just kind of take for granted nowadays for games. Back then, if you bought a snooker game, you know, you expected just to get snooker. You didn't expect to have a whole separate um, pool table and darts and whatever the hell else they had. Oh, get out of the way, taxi. But yeah, I've since I, I own that game now. But um, back in the day, I, I definitely rented a few times. I think my dad, my dad used to play snooker a lot, and he wasn't. My dad didn't like games, but I was like, oh, let's buy this and play snooker together. It'd be really fun. And we played a game against Jimmy White, and Jimmy White just basically cleared up the table. It wasn't fun. And I don't think I rented it again. I think I just rented Tokyo Highway Challenge multiple times after that. It's a good game, though. But not a patch on Virtual Pool 2 on PC, which we played all the time. It's a shame Dreamcast never got a Virtual Pool 2 port. Although Maximum Pool is really, really good. Played that online quite a bit. Right, we're in trouble here. I can't really take any more hits, I need to stay nicely ahead of this guy, so I need to concentrate. I want to stay on the inner loop, don't hit that guy. Stay on the inner loop because you want to finish off these easier rivals, okay. So I'm guessing, yeah, these credits are basically money that I can spend in a sack. Right, let me just catch up with the chat a minute. Taxi 2 is Life Traitor. Nah. I'm going to watch the film now. Maybe. Uh, there's a slightly weird part of me that wants to watch the film just because I put so many, so much time into the game now. They should have made so you lose your car if you lose the race and you have to hitchhike to get back home. Yeah, that'd be quite funny. Well, it wouldn't be funny. It'd be funny the first time and then after that it'd be really annoying. And I, I probably wouldn't be sat here calling this a nice chilled out game to play. This bloody hands in that game gave me the heebie-jeebies just like in drop zone. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the smoothest game to be fair. Yeah, Max Pool is, is really good. If you have if you do own a Dream Pie, um, then I I do recommend that as a really good game to play online. If you don't own a Dream Pie then speak to PC Wizard in chat and I'm sure he will uh, he will hook you up for a reasonable fee. It's a 
forget it real, why are all these Japanese sports cars sporting California license plates? Crack me up with box first to imports when they're in their native land. Yeah. Well, the actual, the most recent game in the series that was released in in Europe was actually called, and, the, and the America was actually called Import Tuna Challenge, which I did find amusing at the time because I was like, but they're not imports because they are, um, they, they, we were driving in Japan. Right, there's no, there's a blue guy behind us, but let's take this opportunity to go back and... So, can I, what's the difference between end... Why can't I... Oh, because I'm not in a race, that's why. Uh, Max pulls rad. The film is really good. Taxi 2. Yeah. Ooh, we have a new battle name. Worthless Youth. Gonna have to update my um, my Twitter bio now. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the UK sells them, but uh, I got mine from PC... Uh, he shipped it from the US. It was very reasonably priced, and I would wholeheartedly recommend the service that you get from him. So, uh, yeah. Off the top of my head, it was about $120 US dollars, including shipping. Uh, what am I doing here now? Do we want to buy a new car then? Or do we want to. Let's have a look how much a new car is going to cost us. So I'm guessing a, okay, so we have got, yeah, so we can afford an A-class car now. So there's a Supra, Skyline, <laughs> spend those points on a speaker system and neon lights like a true boy racer. I tell you, when, when the 17-year-old me was playing this with a, uh, with a Honda Civic catalogue on the on my bedroom table that I was aspiring to one day be able to afford, I would have thought not twice about putting neon lights underneath it. Yes, Dreamcast Live does have all the instructions to make a dream pie. Just depends whether you are so inclined. Right. Well, we can. Have, the good news is we can afford. An A-class car. Oh, a nice little Evo. So I'm thinking we do this, and that'll save us upgrade, and that'll give us a bit of a, a bit of a boost. Ooh, a nice Subaru as well. What do we go for? These are all the same. I don't know the 280 or 250 brake. So, what's it going to be, folks? Oh, we should get the NSX, really, shouldn't we? I do like the NSX. So this is in my dream garage. If I could afford an NSX just to sort of have parked up for occasional drives and track days, I would 100% own an NSX. They are stunning. Especially if you get an NSXR. I'm going to go for NSX because no one has said otherwise in the chat. We're going to get a black NSX. Oh, hang on. I thought we did have enough money. I've got... Hang on, I've got a... Oh, it's because I'm looking at the wrong bloody screen here. So we can't afford that. Can we afford a B-Class? Yes, we can afford a B. Is that a Lexus? Maybe we should be upgrading rather than buying new. No, we can't afford these either. Okay. So, let's upgrade then. Power. It's got to be power first, right? So, 3,200. We're not getting huge gains from that. Clutch brakes, front tyres. I wouldn't mind a bit more grip, to be honest, but I'd rather get some. I can deal with that once we've uh, once we're in the lead. I think that's the. It does make you think about how you uh, how you upgrade because the, the nature of the game is obviously getting in the lead and staying in the lead. Right, that'll do for now. Let's get back out there. Let's do the outer loop now then. See what difference that makes. 
cars are your wheelhouse, James. Do the upgrade you want. Don't open it up to vote. Thanks, mate. The problem is, though, is I also I'm also known for loving Spirit of Speed, so people tend to not not always uh, trust my judgment when it comes to uh, to cars. Right, we're staying on. Oh, I just got on the inner now. After I said I was going to stay on the outer. Never mind. There's a blue guy here. We're going to chase down. So this car feels a lot quicker already. Nice frame rate on this game as well. Again, I think it's worth you know reiterating that um, it is. Uh, oh, this is a this is a bit of a nightmare. We need to go on the out outer. I'm going to go back out. Go back in. Um. Yeah, I'll reiterate that obviously it's afforded the luxury of being able to run at a nice frame rate because there's not an awful lot going on um, in the background and stuff. But, um, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. And it's uh, it's still a super, super impressive game to, um, to, see, to see running at the end of the day. I still can't go over how good the car models are. I think it's um, they did such a good job. I, I kind of want to get revenge on the pink guy before uh, before we finish. Now that's going to be the aim for the rest of the stream is to level up enough to be able to take down Pinky. Right, we're staying out. Uh, we're staying out. Uh, As I was just complimenting it on the frames, we got a bit of a stutter there. I didn't. I don't think there is an official license with this game. I don't think the cars are, are actually branded as Honda and Mitsubishi and so on. I think they just use the model names, and I don't know whether that's to stop having to use the license or whether they're just being really cheeky. I don't know. I didn't really think to check. But they definitely don't have badges on, so there's definitely not like a Honda badge, which would lead me to believe they do not have the license to use Honda or whatever other manufacturer we are talking about. So that's an interesting consideration. unlock the car then as well I think it just said so it's a, it's very grindy this game as well I would say it's very grindy if you like a grind and I think you can probably see already what the what the criticisms are with this game from a, a, a replay and depth perspective is whilst there may be loads of rivals to beat driving around the same piece of motorway does get a little bit dull after a while and I think you know if you think back to this sort of era racing games were still in that hole we're gonna have a forest phase we're gonna uh, stage we're gonna have a an ice track we're gonna have a um, you know a jungle track we're gonna have and they were very distinctively different looking tracks so I think having just this one nighttime version of the, uh, the Japanese motorway was probably very, uh, very much more obvious then than it was now. Bidding a copy of Zero Gunner 2 that ends tomorrow. You'll better leave it alone. So why, stop broadcasting it then. Our six billion followers are going to be uh, are going to be straight on that bidding on it now. Right, this car feels quicker. I think we should go back to the inner. I think we should go after Pinky. 
I will also say that having played, as I said, the more recent entries into the uh, into the series, I was mentioned earlier on about the storyline. The storyline definitely adds a bit more of adds adds a lot more structure to what it is you're doing. Like at the moment, we're just kind of driving around, hoping we see people. Whereas as basic as they were in in the newer games, where they've got the bit of a storyline, you know, which kind of just tell you that you need to look out for X, Y, or Z, and they normally hang about here, here, and here. And I know that information is that information is partly here, but you've got to go looking for it. Whereas you kind of had like cut not cutscenes, but the game would sort of stop you and and prompt you to do certain things. Um, in the newer ones, so it probably makes it feel a bit less uh, less barren. Right, who's this? You've seen this guy before. Second game having lots of annoying product placement. Uh, I can't say I've noticed any annoying product placement yet. Uh, I did notice when we were doing the upgrade there were some real life brands. I think product placement is okay as long as it adds to the realism. Like when it's obviously been shoehorned in, then no. But when you've got like, if you're looking at air intakes and the product placement is a, a HKS badge or something, then that just makes it feel more realistic in my opinion. Whereas Tower Records, Levi Jeans, and KFC and Crazy Taxi felt like they were pretty cool at the time because, again, it was a city. But when you play that retrospectively now, you realize, man, how much they were pushing those on you. The product placement was the signs being replaced with Western import racing brands. I will have to look harder for them then. I think in the latter games as well, you didn't have any daytime racing, but you did have like different times of the of the night, so you could um, you could go and like find certain people, certain rivals that would appear at certain times. Which again, added a bit more sort of strategy to it. I don't think that's in here. I haven't seen a clock anywhere anyway. Yeah, some some product placements of games are awful. little things as well that are quite nice. I, mean, I know the whole point of the game is to obviously upgrade your car, but um, you know, even though we've only done basic upgrades now to the um, the sort of the engine, the manifold, and the exhaust, you know, you can visu visually see the difference in the exhaust system already. You know, that sort of detail is pretty cool, especially seeing as you know, arguably the people who are going to be interested in this sort of game are those who do enjoy modifying cars potentially which would explain why they've changed the product placement for marketing around those brands for that exact reason. I'm pretty sure you know you were joking about neons earlier on. Again, in the newer games, you definitely could buy that sort of stuff. You definitely could add flair to your car as well as performance upgrades. I'm not sure if this one allows you to. But I know a lot of the boss characters, the, the, the rivals, have got um, more exuberant uh, vehicle flare uh, and I know you could do that too to, a, to certain, certain degrees right, who's this? it's nice that we're trying to race against some non-white cars like this cat sign yeah I I did laugh about the I did notice the cats one earlier and think it's uh, 
I did think of the musical as well, funnily enough. Right, these rivals are definitely a lot harder. Luckily, they are very uh, eager on the brakes, should we say, so you can often get ahead of them and then uh, try and keep them behind, or they'll just let him back through. Didn't see what car he was in, I don't know if it's like an FTO or something, I couldn't really see. Oops. Interestingly, and I had this conversation on Discord today, this is the only named Dreamcast racing game that has a sequel. So it's, as in what I mean by that, it's the only Dreamcast racing game that has a number one and a number two. Uh, sorry, one of the only. There's one other Dreamcast racing game franchise that has a number one and a number two. Uh, anyway guess what that is or if anyone knows what that is you get bonus points I think Mike it was you and I having a conversation in Discord about it so you don't count does anyone else know the other direct sequel racing game on Dreamcast if I wasn't writing a book on Dreamcast racing games I probably wouldn't have got it straight away not an obvious one. It's not test drive. And the reason I say it's not test drive is because those games weren't test drive as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> In Europe, they were not test drive games. Test Drive V Rally, Test Drive Le Mans, and Test Drive Well, Test Drive I don't think Test Drive 6 actually came out in the in the EU, did it? I don't think it did. But no, it's not that. It's not that. I'm talking about a game with a specific number two in the title. Correct animated. It is indeed F1 World Grand Prix and F1 World Grand Prix 2. The only two Dreamcast racing games that have the original and the direct sequel in the library. Look at this guy's rims. He's got some purple wheels. Look at that. See, now that definitely said Prelude on the back of it then. So it's, it's weird. They've got like the um, the model names, but not the manufacturer names. And I don't know if that's some weird loophole that means they didn't have to buy the licenses because they can just say, well, it's not a Honda Prelude. It's just a car that's called Prelude. And I don't know if like copyright law was quite as tight back then as far as game licensing as it is nowadays. But they couldn't have had the full license because they would have had Honda logos on otherwise. I, like, there's no reason why they wouldn't have a Honda badge. I really don't get why it only has part of the... Unless it was choice, which just seems crazy to me. Because surely if you've got the license, you're going to want to use it. Pretty nice replay as well. Different angles. Nice and smooth again. I think replay modes were something that was, um, you know, by this point in in 2000, 2001, replay modes in racing games, the novelty had worn off a bit, and I think people could start to see that how messy they actually were, and the, the game engines didn't look particularly great when you uh, when you saw it back in replay mode. Not true of every game, of course, but um, I think that looks pretty nice. So I guess the question, ultimately, like I always try and answer on every stream we do, is should you go and play this? And I think I would say yes. It's um, it's an acquired taste for sure, which feels like almost every Dreamcast game I play, I say that about. It's definitely an acquired taste. I don't think every racing game fan is going to like it because I think a lot of people will get bored of it. 
Um, unless you're into the collecting side, I certainly re wouldn't recommend buying it, given the, the high prices that it demands. But if you have like a GDMU or other means, it's definitely worth playing just to sort of uh, give it a uh, get a feel for it. As I said, I, I you quite easily kill an hour or so on this just driving around. I think if you have a very set sort of path about how you want to get through the game and get everything finished, and you're just kind of quitting out back to the menu all the time just to sort of get back in as optimally as you possibly can, I don't think it's going to be as enjoyable. But just to kind of, uh, yeah, exactly. It's in short bursts. It's it's good fun. Okay, so this looks like another boss then. Or certainly something significant with that horrendously low res uh, icon popping up on the screen. So we can assume we're going to get our ass handed to us again here. Especially if this taxi doesn't move out of the way. I love it when these the, the traffic basically gets in the way so much that the, the races just cancel and they've got to start them again. Come on, get on with it. Alright, here we go. Is he going to drive off into the distance? No. Uh, he, wow. He's going to ram me into the wall and then drive off into the distance. Okay, those bosses are really in another league, aren't they? Although he seems to have... Oh, that's not him, that's a taxi. I was going to say he seems to slow down, but that wasn't even the same guy. Yeah, we are definitely not tuned up enough to... Uh, put these guys in any sort of danger. Every time I think I'm catching up with him, it just turns out to be another taxi. Yeah, definite short burst game. I would, I would totally agree with that. If you want to finish these games as well, like properly finish them 100%, you know, you're talking multiple hours, multiple tens of hours. If you want to beat every single car, collect every uh, every boss and everything. And as I said, for most people, I just don't think they could stomach driving around the same piece of track for that amount of time. The most hours I put into one of these was again the 360 version. Because I was going for the full gamer score on it, which was a pretty hard one to, to achieve back in the day. No, I don't want to race you. Go away. You're too good. Um, and yeah, I put I put a lot of hours into that game to try and uh, finish it 100%. And I think once you've beaten all the, the gangs, then you had about 12 different bosses to do, and each of those bosses was insanely difficult. Like You basically had to to learn the route and, and perfect a run. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it became, it got to the point where it was just like, I, I'd invest so many hours into it, probably like close to 100 hours, and it was like, I'm not leaving it with three bosses left to finish or something. So it was just, every day you just practice for like a couple hours just to try and perfect that route. There was quite a um, from memory on the 360 one, there was quite a I wouldn't say active, but there was a handful of people who were constantly trying to go for the leaderboards. And again, as you can imagine, the leaderboards, to improve the leaderboards on half of these games it, it literally was you do something a fraction better. Don't you miss achievements trophies in old games? Um... Yes and no. I go through phases. I used to be mad on achievements. Like it, got, it would get to the point where if a game didn't have achievements, it was like, what's the point in playing it anymore? Um, I, I, as I said, it, I, I kind of go through phases, but I think um, a lot of the time it's just nice to, to pick up and play a game without the worry of not the worry, but it's a, it's a bad word for it. But I think people feel like they have to they have to unlock everything and, and the thing about most achievements in most modern games is they're 
if they actually added something to the gameplay, like if they added um, made you play the game in, a, in, a, in an enjoyable, different way, then that'd be fine. But a lot of achievements don't. They they just a lot of them are more frustrating than anything else. There are some websites, I don't know the name of them off the top of my head, but there are some websites that kind of have achievements for old games. Obviously it's not automatic or anything, but it does uh, give you certain like um, ways to go about doing things. Some of the games, like Zeno Cider that we played a couple weeks ago, obviously it's a new it's a new Dreamcast game, but that's got achievements built in as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I do like... I've got nothing against achievements. I do like achievements or trophies in general. Um, yeah, retro achievements. That's what I was thinking of. The other problem is when you, when you get a game that you're really looking forward to and the achievements are really rubbish in it like they're really really pants it's it's almost a it has the opposite effect of making you want to play it more then it kind of makes you think oh, i can't be bothered that because i'll never get those achievements but at the end of the day i always say this you know the reason most of us yeah, the reason most of you are sat watching today and the reason why I'm sat here playing this game is because we do it because of the nostalgia. So I'm not playing it because I want to finish the game or I want to do X, Y, or Z. I'm playing it because it reminds me of a time that made me smile when I was younger and enjoy playing these games. And yeah, it's great that these games still feel really good to play now. But adding old stuff to new game uh, adding new stuff to old games sorry like achievements to these sort of games does does nothing for me really because it's uh, I'm not in it for that I'm in it because as I said a lot of the time for Dreamcast especially it's either playing games that I loved when I was a kid or playing the games that I couldn't afford when I was a kid and now I'm able to play them and that's, ultimately, this goes back to that's why I play Dreamcast online instead of going and playing on my PS5 online or something every night because it, it, I have a lot of nostalgia and, and uh, you know, nostalgia is a hell of a drug. It lets us go back to a simpler time where all we had to worry about was how we were going to find 40 quid to buy the next game that we wanted. So, uh, Xenocider, I'm not sure if you watched my stream of Xenocider uh, animated, but um, th there, is a, there is quite a nice arc to the difficulty to it, as in, oh, we're getting challenged by the, uh, the boss man now, and oh, we might be able to beat this guy, because this is the first group of... Uh, uh, the first gang. Uh, Xenocide. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you watched my stream. It took me a while. Probably took me about 40 minutes. But when I finally got my head around it, it really clicked. And I wouldn't say I'm an expert player, but it took me like half an hour to get past the first level. And then I pretty much got through every level following that. Uh, no... So uh, I I would really recommend giving it a shot. I really enjoyed it. I wasn't expecting to because shooters are not my uh, my forte. It's not a genre that I've ever particularly uh, cared for. Um, but I really enjoyed it. So yeah, I wouldn't be put off by the difficulty. Uh, if you did play it for too long, because um, yeah, it uh, you do you do pick it up pretty quickly, and there's a ton of stuff to do in that game as well. Talk about depth and replayability. There are a ton of different things that you can uh, do. So this says Rolling Boy number one. Does that mean he is number one? 
Well, does that mean he's number one of a certain amount of bosses that we've got for this particular game? I should worry about just beating him first, really, shouldn't I? Because at the moment I'm about to lose to him. Oh, don't let it get ahead. I'm in trouble. just going to do me. Oh, we just saved it. Can we finish it? Got to stay ahead. Can't hit any walls. Too many walls. This is going to be close. Oof. Uh, I did, it made me want to try it, but I just find it far too hard to make out where the enemies as character blocks. Yeah, I, I know I, I know what you mean by that. I still I still struggled, my head still struggled with the whole using the left and right triggers to move left and right and the stick just to move the, the um, targeting uh, rectile. It's not perfect by any stretch, but I thought it was really enjoyable. It's definitely, it is... It is definitely the best um, indie game that's been released on, on Dreamcast. Right, so I think that was the boss. we got time for a couple more races. We'll race these, uh, these blue guys. Oh, they're going out, I think. Okay. Uh, don't forget, next week is the book club stream. So I'm not going to be on that one. But uh, as usual, Kev will be hosting that with... Um, I think Andrew's going to be on it. And I think Lewis is going to be on it as well. They are going to be covering the excellent Power Stone games. So Power Stone 1 and 2. I feel like I say this all the time and it's not, not really an interesting fact anymore but interesting fact is that Power Stone, the Japanese version of Power Stone, was the first Dreamcast game that I ever played. It was mid-99 I think and my local game store someone had brought in the employees, I presume, had brought in his Japanese imported console, and they used to have a really huge TV uh, at the back of the store, where they used to do like dem customer demos if a customer wanted to see a game running before, but the TV was huge, like back then, um, it was like multiple sort of flat screen plasmas or whatever the hell they were back then. Uh, could have been plasma, it must have been CRT, but anyway. And, um, yeah, they had the Dreamcast running, the Japanese one, and the um, first game they booted up was uh, Power Stone, and that was my first experience of using a Dreamcast controller and playing a game. I'd already kind of made up my mind by then, I think this must have been the summer of 99 or something. I'd already contemplated um, importing one. But, as I said, I was like 16, well, 15 at the time. I was 15 and poor. So, uh, importing was unfortunately not an option for me. And actually, I didn't end up getting one on European launch in October of 99. Didn't have quite enough money, so I had to wait for my birthday in November. I remember it well because I got the rest, I think I was about 50 quid short or something like that and I had the rest of the money for my birthday um, and my dad took me down to Comet because it was down the road from where we lived and I bought my Dreamcast on my, my 16th birthday at Comet. There are no weather effects mad unfortunately. 
there are no weather effects. There is no sunlight. It's just nighttime driving. This game really did the proper soundtrack. Yeah, I needed it. The Sonic Adventure multi level demo appeared in my local Odeon around August. Oh my god. Or Odeon demo kiosks. So that was pretty much once I played that Japanese one, that must have been like June, July time or something like that. It was definitely before the kiosks came out. And me and my mate used to go into town in Cardiff and they they had a um they had a demo kiosk in uh in the Odeon. You're absolutely right. We used to play that. We used to go in there and it was the um what we used to play all the time was the Sonic demo and the um, uh, the Ready to Rumble boxing demo. And then when, when we get kicked out of Odeon, we go into uh, Toys R Us because Toys R Us also had the, the, the same uh, the same kiosk. Uh, not really mad. I mean, some some games used to have weather. But I mean, nothing, nothing realistic looking. I mean, this this game has got a very specific uh, aesthetic, which is, it's always had, as I said before. So, um, but no, zero rain. Yeah, Odium was was massive for uh, the Dreamcast kiosks. I'm trying to think what else they had. It was Sonic Adventure, Ready to Rumble. Was there Trick Style on there as well? I want to say Trickstar was on there. I could be wrong though. Man, Ready to Rumble was such a good game. Maybe I'm making it up and Trickstar wasn't on there. I really can't remember. Yeah, Odeon and Toys R Us are the two that I definitely remember. I can I can picture where the kiosk was in the Odeon in uh, in town as well. The first time I played went Odeon Cardiff opposite the train station, ready to rumble. Yeah, that's exactly the one opposite Queen Street Station. And I can physically remember where it was in there as well. It's weird how they were in cinemas, wasn't it? I remember playing, I'm pretty sure I had like a crazy taxi rolling demo or something like that on there. I remember being disappointed because I was thinking, thinking it was going to be a playable one. And then when I got my Dreamcast on my birthday, I've told this story before as well on, on the podcast, I think, but... When I got my Dreamcast on my birthday, uh, again, woe is me, didn't have enough money for any games, so um, I basically lived off of the Dream On demo disc that came with the console and the first magazine demo disc, which is basically that Sonic Adventure demo and Millennium Soldier Expendable, and I pretty much played that exclusively for over a month until Christmas Day, and then I had Virtua Fighter and something else for Christmas, come to what. But I played the Monaco Grand Prix demo pretty much non-stop between November and Christmas Day. That's what got me through my early adopter days of being a Dreamcast uh, owner. And then, yeah, it was uh, Virtua Fighter was the first uh, the first game I had Christmas played the hell out of that right this guy looks like we're not going to beat him but we'll give it a go now nah, Odeon was just a cinema I think Sega must have had like don't forget as well at the time they were you know the, again the gaming landscape was changing quite a bit they were they were targeting kind of like young adults more back then think about the PlayStation 1 really kind of 
change the the sort of scene as far as who was playing games or who the games were targeted at. You know, before the PlayStation One, everything else was targeted really at sort of the kids. And I think when PlayStation came on the scene, they were targeting more of that kind of young adult. And I think obviously Sega did the same with the Dreamcast, which is why I think it ended up at cinemas because uh, obviously a lot of teenagers go to cinemas. And I think, you know, the Saturn didn't have a particularly great presence in the UK. Well, anywhere really, but especially in the UK. And I think Sega were trying to um, reinvent themselves in many ways with Dreamcast, weren't they? And I guess trying to appeal to a... Uh... Well, that's interesting. That, that build on the left there had the Japanese name of the game written on it. Um, yeah, they were trying to reinvent themselves a bit, weren't they? So, uh, trying to appeal to, uh, to that. Oh, pick a side, any side. I was trying to look at the map then and decide which way I wanted to go. Right, we'll do probably one more race. As we all know, the biggest problem with the Dreamcast marketing was not so much the marketing they did, but the fact that most people were waiting for PS2. Nobody really cared. Which, as we know, is just a side footnote in history now. Shame is that the game didn't have any fully full online features other than the time trial stuff. I always say it may have made the difference between the game doing well or not, but then I don't think people were really that receptive to online gaming even back then. Some of us were, as I said, I used to actively go out my way to buy games that were online at the time, but I'm not sure if. Uh, this being online would have made any difference and I, I think it probably wouldn't have been the best experience online anyway. Do one race, last 30 seconds. And then re -dialing. Right, come on, this is our last race. Let's make it a good one. Who's it going to be? That's a taxi. Looks like a Honda Civic to me. Ooh, that might be a new gang as well. The Galaxy something or other. I saw that. That is definitely a Honda Civic. Galaxy Racers, Street Bunny. Street Bunny's a bit quicker than me. Can we muscle past? So that we can finish on a win.
We can. We can. And that has been Import or Tokyo Highway Challenge 2 or Tokyo Extreme Racer 2 depending on what floats your boat. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Very nice looking game. Something that really works even by modern day standards. Uh, we'll be back for the community choice, as I said, probably in a couple of weeks. We seem to be doing this every other Saturday at the moment, which works pretty well for me. Um, we'll do some impromptu streams in between, I'm sure, like the Taxi 2 one. Uh, I got a few in mind that I want to just kind of... Um, I want to cover on a stream. Uh, one of which might be Typing of the Dead, might be quite cool. Um, we... As I said before, we've got the... Um, uh, the the book club next week, I believe on Thursday. So please uh, check that out as well. Uh, thanks for the follow, uh, free ride, um, or the host rather. A bit late, but thank you. Um, yeah, check the um, uh, check the stream out on Thursday for the guys who are doing the book club uh, covering Power Stone. That should be a really good watch. Uh, I'll be in chat watching it with uh, with you all. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll do something. One of the other ideas I had was just to kind of do a bit of a um, uh, yeah no not taxi, do a bit of a sort of stream where we kind of play through a longer game, but like do an hour or two here and there. So um, I was thinking something like Headhunter or Echo the Dolphin or something like that. That's just a bit more of a we'll get through it together and go in blind and just kind of um, yeah figure it out a bit as we go on. So maybe that could be something that we can uh, uh, we can schedule uh, at some point as well. But, uh, yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to leave it there. So yeah, thanks everyone. Check out the blog. Check out the um, uh, the podcast, uh, and obviously check out the Discord as well. We've got a really great community building on the uh, on the Discord. So uh, so it'll be great to see some of you uh, some of you in there. But I'm going to say goodnight for now. Cheers all.